So what I'm going to present you today is the Cambiosco project. So the one for which I am a PI, so a principal investigator on in the framework of the Macro Planet Grid Again call. Of course, uh, this is not only my work. It's also uh, the work of several, several people, uh, including four postdocs. Uh, their names are there, Shivesh Karan, Ernesto Rosero, Ariane Albers, and uh, Patrick Brassard, and uh, eight a PhD students, three of which graduated. Uh, yeah, I won't need them <laughs> to save a bit of time. And some of my colleagues here at the Toulouse uh, Biotechnology Institute. So a bit of the context before to tell you what is this work. So th this work takes its context uh, mostly in the Paris Agreement and among other the, the IPCC uh, report on the 1.5 degrees Celsius and the differences it makes uh, between 1.5 and 2. Uh, I won't go too much in the details, but just highlight uh, three main points. So one is that as you may know already, uh, we need greenhouse gas reductions now, or the soonest possible. Uh, second is that uh, we may need, uh, if we don't want to overpass 1.5 or 2 degree, um, to induce some carbon dioxide removal. So take some carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere and have it out of there forever or for a very long time. And uh, third, uh, we need to leave fossil carbon as much as we can in the ground so we don't use it up and emit some uh, additional CO2 emission that stay there for a very long time. So this set the scene for the Cambio School project. What we want to do there is to do everything we do in the economy today, all the services like transport, like chemicals, like material, where we use uh, fossil carbon. We would like to do that, but instead without using any fossil based uh, carbon. Uh, and uh, doing that in a sustainable way. And I'm going to come back to what does that mean? But if we want to do this, uh, how can we do that? <clears throat> well, first thing that we can do is not to use any carbon at all. So that is something we can do to some extent with electricity, like with uh, hydropower, to some extent nuclear, the wind and the sun energy. And this electricity we can convert into services. I don't know if you see this, uh, like heat or like transport. And this allows us to do a bit of things without uh, carbon at all. However, we still need to eat, we still need materials, we still need chemicals. So we can't do everything by decarbonizing. Uh, so where do we take this carbon from? If we don't want to use any fossil carbon, uh, we have the carbon from the biomass. So that's the most obvious and the most accessible to some extent. It can be whether land dependent, this is when you grow directly on the land or it can come from the residues. This is the stream that we investigate uh, within Cambioscope the most, but not only. Uh, we can also take up carbon from the atmosphere. That's the so-called direct air capture or DAC technology uh, and use it to produce any type of hydrocarbons that we need. And uh, we can and we should uh, recycle the carbon that we have uh, within our system. We call that the technosphere. So we should try to recycle it as much as possible. Uh, so we use or uh, scarce carbon uh, as uh, efficiently as possible, because this is what we have to understand. In a low fossil carbon economy, carbon becomes a rather limited resource. Um, yes, and now the Cambiosco project. So what we want to do is to do exactly that, but for France. So how can we in France by 2050 uh, supply or, uh, as much as possible of our goods and services without uh, fossil carbon. So to build a sort of investment roadmap to get there in a sustainable way. So the project is built into six research objectives. I won't go to all of them today, but there is a first one where there we uh, look at, okay, what kind of biomass residue, because I said we focus on biomass residue. So what kind of biomass residues we have and I come back to this. Um, 
where exactly are they located? What do we do with it today? And uh, what is the impact of what we do with it today? So anything else that we would want to do with that should be better. So that sets our uh, environmental threshold. Then we have a second research objective where we investigate different ways to, com to, to convert these residual biomasses into different products and services. And to some extent, also including uh, the direct air carbon capture and uh, renewable or fluctuating power uh, to produce a variety of products and services. Uh, and I come back to those that we are investigating. Uh, then we have another research objective that we call the carbon farming. And this is where, uh, and that's uh, one that I'm gonna present first. This is where we challenge uh, the hypothesis that we need to leave a certain portion of our crop residue, so straw uh, among other. Typically we would say we need to, to take up no more than 30% of all these residues, otherwise we would deplete the stock of soil organic carbon. So here we, we think that if we do that, we may deprive ourselves from a valuable resource for the bioeconomy, because as I said, um, there, there is not much uh, in, in, a, in an economy without fossil carbon we lack, uh, or carbon becomes a scarce resource. So here we, we want to look into, okay, what if we consider how this biomass is used and we may have a return? And also where exactly it is used up, because in some places we can take more than other. I come back to this. And finally, we had the, the biopump that Heino was mentioning. And here's the idea is to have some species, uh, plant species that uh, can be grown into particular area among other uh, marginal land or lands where we wouldn't grow anything anyway. And that uh, these plants can induce a net transfer of carbon from the atmosphere to the soil. Of course, this is not something permanent, but at least it helps us to win a little bit of time. And we have two services because we have a carbon sequestration. So we have a net transfer of carbon from the atmosphere to the soil, but we also then have a useful biomass that can be used in the bioeconomy and provide the mitigation service so substitutes some fossil-based carbon. And uh, finally, and this I won't go uh, through that today, but there are also some uh, societal aspects to look at. So we have a rather technological project here, but how do you make this into a societal project uh, needs to, to consider some additional aspects. So a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, I'm talking a lot about carbon, but it's not only that that is considered. Uh, I'll come back to this, but we look at all possible flow of substances. I'm going to present a few of the results that we have, and these will show you the impact on climate, but it's not the only impact we look at. We look at all the 16 environmental impact in the particular method that we are using. So also uh, impact on water resources, impact on eutrophication. So it's not only climate that is included. And uh, that's the bad news. So we don't have much results yet. And that is because of the way the project is built. So now we are building the modular building block that will lead us to our final uh, strategies uh, at the end of the project in 2023. But I present you some of these modular building blocks that we have now. Uh, we were discussing it off with Heiner, so he asked me what is LCA or life cycle assessment, and it's quite the basis of the work. So I'm going to say a few words about what that is. Uh, in brief, it's an environmental assessment method. Uh, there is a two ISO standard to, to, let's say, normalize it and say how uh, life cycle assessment should be carried. And it has two main aspects. One aspect is that uh, you will look at a product, so here, say, an helicopter, through its whole life cycle. So from the production of the different materials, you will gather all the emissions related to that. Then the product manufacturer, the same, you will use your helicopter, it's going to burn some fuel maybe, so you look into that as well. And then at the end of its lifetime, some part might be landfill, other part might be incinerated, 
uh, composted, well, in this case not, but this whole life cycle uh, is going to be uh, considered. And the second particularity is that we look at all the possible flow. So as I said, not just carbon, but nitrogen, phosphorus, mineral flow, everything. Um, so these are the two key aspects of LCA. And what we do here is something we call strategic LCA. So we look at big system. So in this case, um, it's the, let's say the carbon economy system. We look at different alternatives, could be a fossil alternative. It can be these um, non-fossil <laughs> uh, alternative. Then we make the LCA of it. I will use the term LCA from now and not life cycle assessment. And then we supply to decision makers, okay, which solution is better, say A is better than B. And uh, there's a decision that is gonna be taken. Typically A is gonna be implemented. And the fact that we implement A is going to make a difference in the world. And that is this difference that we're trying to capture in our life cycle assessment model. So there is a little bit of a, um, it's an economy aspects included into it. So in brief, we study the world through what we can call a macroscope. So that's why I chose an helicopter. We really look at system from the above, but collect a lot of little data that uh, some other colleagues uh, will produce. Looking at innovative processes, for example. And, uh, but to do that, we need to first understand the world and how it can develop. There are several aspects to that, but when it comes to um, bio-based economy, uh, one thing that is really critical and that can make a system unsustainable is land. So one thing we need to understand is that we have a limited amount of land, so 12.5 giga hectare if we exclude Antarctica. And uh, out of that, uh, we have 4.5 giga hectare that is agricultural land. So 1.4 that is arable land where we plant our crops. That's about the size of um, South America. And 3.1 giga hectare of pasture. That's where we have um, animals grazing, uh, where we have the grass. That's about the size of uh, Africa. Then we have uh, 4.9 giga hectare of forest and we have three. 0.1 giga hectare that is practically unusable for agriculture. And what is uh, very important to understand is that already today we are using about 40% less of our land cover just uh, for agriculture. And now we're saying that we want to use that or we want to produce more uh, biomass to supply other services like, as I was saying, uh, eventually some energy, but also materials, chemicals. And the reason why I speak about this is to quickly make a parenthesis to the so-called land use changes, because that's very important. So if we are in places like often is the case in Europe, where we use pretty much um, a greatest share of the land for agriculture already, and we want to produce a bioeconomy crop. Here I put miscanthus, but it could be something else. Hemp, for example. Uh, and what is going to happen is that, okay, we since we have already pretty much of our land area used for agriculture, and we have very often intention to maintain the forest cover. So what happened, and that's what we observe, is that one crop that is grown today is going to be kicked out, so not produced anymore to produce uh, or bioeconomy crop. And there is something called the direct land use changes is the differences in flow between cultivating this bioeconomy crop instead of that uh, crop uh, that we are kicking out. But the thing is that by kicking out this crop, we induce also impacts on the market because it's still demanded on the market. So what's gonna happen is that the most competitive supplier is going to react to that. And there is two key reaction. One reaction is to increase the yield where it pays off to do so. Uh, that can be done by several ways. So whether you put more fertilizer, that's often the response we observe, but it can be uh, irrigation. It can be also to some new crop breeding. So this uh, reaction here we call intensification. So produce more out of the same hectare of land. But another reaction is that somewhere in the world, uh, land that was nature is deforested uh, for agriculture. And this is very important because when this happened, 
uh, you have several reactions, but one is that all the carbon contained in, in this biomass typically is just burned on site because it's easier to, to convert uh, the land for agriculture. And then you had carbon that was stored uh, in the land for several years, and that is the same, the carbon from the soil is then oxidated, and, and also you have some uh, carbon releases. So that's often referred to as indirect land use changes, and we consider that in our life cycle assessment. And just to show that uh, this, is, uh, this is true, <laughs> Uh, that was a, a paper in Nature. Now it's, it dates a bit. It was from 2019, but it, it was showing that the, it was observed uh, when you had a bit of a trade war between the US and China, and China was no longer importing the soy from the US, and you could observe already that in the Amazon uh, there was deforestation taking place because China was importing more soy from Brazil. So Another thing that is important is the opportunity and challenges uh, from the fluctuating power. So what you show here is an illustration from a former work. Uh, well, it's from Den for Denmark, but it, it shows here the 8,600 and something hours of the year. And here you have power in megawatt hour. And you can see uh, in blue that's the electricity consumption. And one thing we have to know is that we always match in the grid uh, the amount of power that is demanded. So the power supplied is match is always match matching the power that is demanded. If you don't do that, then you have breakdown. So there is a, a technical system operator uh, in all European country in charge to make this balance. Uh, and then in black, you have the fluctuating power, say uh, wind and sun uh, in this case. And what we can observe is that, uh, yeah, this was for 2017, where 45% of the electricity supply was from this fluctuating power production. And this was the projection for 2035 based on the announced investment and capacity. Uh, and what we can see is that, uh, okay, there's going to be instances, uh, like in this case, a lot of instances where we're going to have more uh, power produced than what is actually needed, meaning that we can use it, for instance, uh, as a supply to water electrolysis, where we separate water into hydrogen and oxygen, and this hydrogen can be used and combined with some other carbon to produce a variety of hydrocarbons. But we can also see that there are some wide gaps, like here, for example, where uh, the fluctuating power is not enough, and that's where we need a storable source of uh, energy. Uh, and that's where it is important to remember that we have some sources uh, that are more flexible <laughs> or storable than other, like, for example, biogas that you uh, convert to biomethane and you can store in the grid so you can use it exactly here where it matters, where there's no wind. While if you have some other technology like um, waste incineration, where you have to run in continuous, and in this case, uh, you, well, you compete in some instances with the wind. I can realize that you may not see my, yeah. Yeah, in some instances where you do compete uh, with the wind. Uh, so the basis of what of our life cycle assessment, as I say, is that we try to consider the full system. This is a simple example uh, where straw is uh, used to produce bio oil uh, as a heat source where no district heating is available via paralysis. And uh, you have the resource and what is, and then here you convert it according to the different processes. And what is important to to see is that uh, Sometimes you will produce some cool product. So here's some dust. And this dust is not forgotten. So something is happening with it. We try to understand what it is. In this case, it's used to produce a combined heat and power, or rather uh, just heat in this case. Uh, this heat is supplied uh, to the heat grid and it displays another heat source. So we consider this avoided uh, heat that is no longer produced as a result. Uh, so you can see here, we are interested in the bio oil, but we produce some co-product, so non-compressible gas, uh, a sort of vinegar that can be used as a fungicide. And so as a result, we replace a little bit of conventional fungicide uh, and the biochar okay, that goes to the soil. So 
the point that I want to illustrate is really that we are leaving no co-product alone. We include everything. And then there is always a displacement of services uh, that we have to take into account. And the second thing is that when you deal with residues, as it is the case in Cambioscope, uh, we have to consider, as I was saying, that something was happening with it, even though if we think nothing, like in this case, the straw was, otherwise it would have been just left on the soil to decay, but some part of it may go to the soil and replenish the soil organic carbon pool, and this is no longer happening. So this uh, we have also to take into account. So this is how we model. That will help to understand what follows. Uh, so the first research objective, this was work led by a postdoc, uh, Shivesh, that is now uh, in Sweden. Uh, here, as I said, we inventoried what kind of residual biomass we have uh, and where we have it in France. So we have primary forestry residues. Uh, we have crop residues. Uh, we have pruning residues. These are big categories huh? here aggregated, um, different types of manure, uh, garden waste, uh, sewage sludge, household bio waste, and agri-industrial residues. Uh, some of them we could have at a very fine resolution, like the primary forestry residues, for example, at a, a 10 meter by 10 meter resolution, uh, working with the uh, land cover data produced by SysBio, where they are processing the Sat Sat Sentinel-2 data. And some other stream were more based uh, on French statistics and were at the department uh, level, like the sewage sludge. So we have this difference in resolution. Uh, but what we could see is that uh, overall, well, that is just uh, the overall results, huh? but uh, the largest potential when converted to petajoule is from crop residues, then from manure, uh, then from uh, the primary forestry residues. Uh, household bio waste, this is what we separate today. But we can imagine that when the, the law come in place that we are obliged to separate all bio waste over France, um, what we saw is that this is going to double. Uh, yes, garden waste 3%, sewage sludge 1%. I go to the next. Uh, uh, well, what we can see here is the total. So we have about 2,300 petajoule a year. So it's the equivalent of uh, about the Swiss annual electricity consumption. Uh, we can see uh, where this potential is located and also how it varies according to the different uh, region. All this is, is published, well, nearly all this, <laughs> the, but um, the rest is upcoming very soon. Then we also looked, okay, what we do uh, with these residues today. Uh, and the endeavor to set up this threshold. This is work that we are hoping to publish very soon. We're working hard to finish that before the end of the year. Uh, so I'm going to, to go uh, to our research objective five. I was telling you about this carbon farming, whether we should harvest or not. So here, what we considered was five conversion technology for crop residues. Anaerobic digestion, where you get the gas, this is what you want, but you also get a digestate that you can return to soil. Pyrolysis, where you get a bio oil, but also a biochar that you can return to soil. Hydrothermal liquefaction, where the same as pyrolysis, you get a bio oil as your main product, but also um, what is called here a hydrochar that can be returned. Gasification, uh, where you get not biogas, but syngas, and then you can return. Um, gas char, and then uh, bioethanol, where you get uh, the ethanol, and then you also have a liquid uh, molasses fraction that can be returned to soil. So what we did here is that we build upon uh, the framework that already exists and was developed uh, with, by INRAE. So we collaborated with these researchers, and we look at France in a very, uh, with a very high granularity where we considered the different type of uh, soil and climate, so pedoclimatic unit existing in France, 
uh, crossing that with the different type of crop rotation that have been observed uh, in the last year. And in, in total, uh, we got about 62, well, 62,700, let's say, a simulation unit of different climate and different agricultural practices and different crop rotation. And what we did is that we look at two cases. One case is to leave this as it is uh, today. So we have crop residues and we don't harvest them. And another case was we have crop residue, we har harvest them, but we return what I was showing you, uh, some of the, the fractions. Uh, and, and also, uh, of course, we have converted them for the bioeconomy. So we have that service. Uh, and we projected the climate based on uh, a trajectory that is referred to as a RCP, Representative Concentration Pathway 4.5, uh, based on the data we had. And that was very good because we have uh, data for France that are very site specific. So we use that. And we use a soil carbon model called AMG that was developed in France and calibrated for France. And we collaborated with some of the developer of that model. Uh, one thing that was very important to incorporate was to understand, uh, because these co-products, they have um, a recalcitrance or resistance to degradation that is probably higher than the raw material, than the raw straw. And this is why we have this hypothesis, uh, hypothesis at the to start with that uh, it could be better to actually use them, even though part of the carbon is in our carbon service, then with this co-product that is more resistant to degradation, uh, we might end up to still increase the soil organic carbon stock more than if we had just left the straw where most of it or big part of it is going to simply degrade over the hundred years and not enter the soil organic carbon pool. So we are the, the PhD student uh, that is in charge of this, Christelle Andrade, she made a huge literature review about uh, the recalcitrance of these different products. And also uh, how much of the carbon from the initial straw is going to end up in that uh, byproduct. Uh, so that was an important input to the model. We had to modify the AMG model to incorporate that because it did not. And this is some of the results that we got. So what we could see uh, for biochar and for gas char, uh, so here you see the scale of it. Uh, after 100 years, by returning uh, the char to the field, uh, instead of just leaving the straw, so this is the difference between both, uh, we had increases of about uh, 100 percent uh, to 200 percent. So the scale is a bit big here, but we can see in the case of biochar that was the one where we got the best results. So basically, in the whole of France, we can just take it <laughs> and uh, and return it, and we're going to have a benefit. So that was for 48 percent of the areas uh, we have uh, this increase here between 100 to 200 percent for the gas char. For 88% of the areas we have, well, that's a big scale, but from zero to uh, 100%. And for these three, uh, well, for this one, for the bioethanol molasses, actually, we had decreases. So here it is not too good of a scenario. We better leave the straw uh, if our objective is to maintain the soil organic carbon stocks. But for these two, uh, yeah, we can see that the scale is not as interesting at this one, but we, we could still have a certain increase. So 87% of the area would have an increase from zero to eight and for digestate, 50% uh, of the area. But in some area, uh, you're gonna have some losses. So we are still trying to process these results. We have a lot of sensitivity analysis as well on how we modeled and on these different recalcitrants and carbon conversion rates. Uh, but this is what we have so far. Uh, I'm gonna go, try to go very fast. This is a big module of the Cambiusco project. So that's the building blocks where we build our life cycle inventory. So this is where we break down our processes into unit process and try to understand uh, what comes in, what comes out and assess all the emissions uh, related. So I'm going to present yeah, the, the modules we have uh, in a general manner. 
Uh, one that we have is waste to ingredients, and that might seem a bit counterintuitive. So why would we want to use residues, uh, biomass residues, and convert them into food uh, for animal or even for humans? Uh, but it turns out that a lot of people are interested in that. So we just got a paper accepted in biotechnology advances where we made a review. We found some more than 800 records, whether it's scientific paper, patents. Uh, also, we spoke with some uh, venture capitalist uh, fundings. And we tried to look at different companies. So this is something led by our PhD student, Hugo Chavorez, but uh, also we involve a postdoc, a visiting postdoc, Ernesto Rosero. And we tried here through a literature review to uh, understand the different pathways that exist, allowing us to do that. So we ended up with eight different, uh, let's say, big uh, families. And we also tried to understand, uh, to break down the different building block or unit operation uh, that are needed to do this waste to ingredient conversion. So this is what we find in that paper. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so these are the different waste to ingredients and pathway that we are going to consider in the Cambiusco project. It turns a lot around proteins, so sometimes direct protein ex extraction, whether to the so-called green biorefinery, where you would use some green material, like I was talking about this uh, green, um, like garden waste and green waste where you will press them, then you get, uh, let's say, the protein concentrated in the juice. And this is from that you try to, to extract with different processes uh, the protein from it. Uh, then we have also uh, rapeseed meal extract, where again, you can uh, extract uh, protein from uh, the, the colza the process of having it where you have the oil, but you also have, a, it's a byproduct, the meal, and you try to extract the protein directly out of it. Then there is uh, the use of insects for converting uh, different type of food waste. So whether it is uh, from household or from uh, agri-industrial um, industries. Uh, solid state fermentation or the use of uh, mushrooms to 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 <laughs> give us protein from or break down what we wouldn't uh, be normally able to break down so to render lignin uh, available uh, and convert it as a protein or to use a different type of bacteria uh, and then uh, use uh, these residues to produce whether biogas or syngas uh, according to which type of bacteria and then from that produce a single cell protein. So this is what we are uh, starting to address. So we document the environmental impact link to these conversions. Then we couldn't go around aviation. So we look at different uh, aviation pathways. Uh, so we have biofuels, of course. Uh, we have electrofuel as well. So where we use uh, carbon from the atmosphere combined with uh, hydrogen produced, for instance, from water electrolysis, fueled by surplus power. Uh, then we have also battery, and that already exists, uh, and hydrogen, which is also very popular here at Airbus uh, in Toulouse. So we have in total 11 conversion pathway. Uh, our pathway, but hydrogen aviation require fossil kerosene for long ranges because of the standard of the ASTM. So you need to have a certain content of aromatics. And to get that, you can't uh, have 100% biofuel or electrofuel. So you need to blend. Um, then, uh, well, okay, I can go around that, but uh, our residual biomass is limited, so we cannot believe that uh, we could save the planet by using it all for aviation biofuels. Uh, and we also discovered that the electricity that we need to produce the hydrogen for these electrofuel, if we should supply 100% of the future aviation demand pre-COVID with that, which is of course unrealistic because as I said, we have a blending rate. Uh, but it would be the equivalent of about eight times the current electricity consumption of China. So we have to realize this is not a free lunch either. 
And there is a lot of challenges to ensure fair comparison. Uh, so we have to remember what is the service here. So it's to move a certain quantity of people from A to B. Uh, and that we need to take into account to, to be able to, for example, you may need more of these battery plane to move uh, the quantity of people that you would move with these. Uh, so I will go fast to the different type that we are considering. Uh, and some preliminary results with the waste cooking oil. So EFA is one of the, let's say, most uh, develop a uh, pathway for aviation. And uh, it turns out that the overall environmental impact for climate is way greater. So about the double of what you have with fossil kerosene per megajoule of fuel. One other thing that we do is um, a gas platform. So, or rather methane, yes, for flexible hydrocarbon supply. And here is a case study that we did led by a PhD student, a visiting PhD student, Conchita Lodato, that graduated now, where we look at the Occitanie region of France. And then we looked at all the residual resources that we have in the region, how they are currently used. And then we tried to look, okay, can we supply with that uh, the current demand of methane that we have for the region, yes or no? And um, if yes, how much more? If no, uh, what should we, uh, how much should we import? Uh, this, so we had a 41 different biomass stream that we grouped into 10 biomass categories. Uh, that looks simple, said like that, but it generates a lot of complication. You can imagine when we have to look at the current uses that varies for each of these. Um, then we looked at three technological scenarios to produce the biomethane. Uh, one is anaerobic digestion, uh, and then to produce the biomethane. So you have to understand that uh, when you do anaerobic digestion, you get a biogas that's roughly said 60% of methane and 40% of CO2. Uh, the methane is what you want. So to remove the CO2, there are different, let's say, CO2 removal technique that exists. One is a water scrubber where you bubble the whole gas in, in the water and because of the different uh, diso disability, disability constant, uh, you will end up to have just the methane out and the CO2 is um, not recovered or could be reused elsewhere, but here we consider it as lost. Then we have, uh, yes, anaerobic digestion uh, with uh, hydrogen enhancement. So this is where you could do, as I was saying earlier, the water electrolysis. You produce hydrogen. This hydrogen, you can react it with the CO2 uh, that is in the biogas. And then that produce you uh, other molecules of methane. So this is uh, something that is quite well known and that we considered as well. And then we consider gasification, uh, which is a different process where you would also uh, then do this uh, upgrading, converting this, this carbon, so CO and CO2 part of the syngas uh, with hydrogen. So you only get uh, methane at the end. So I go a bit faster to that. Not all of our different streams can go to the two technologies. So we also consider that. I will skip that. I will skip that also and go straight to some of the results that we got. So we have to understand that the Occitanie region is one of the region in France where there is the least uh, biomethane being produced. Uh, that's the regional demand, 17.5 terawatt hour of methane per year. And what we realize is that if we just do anaerobic digestion, uh, this is what we can get. So much more than the original demand. If we do it with hydrogen enhancement, we get about a double. And if we do gasification, uh, of course, here we convert nearly all of our carbon to, to methane. So of course, here we get much, much more. And that's the overall um, climate impact in CO2 equivalent. So what we can say is that uh, going from anaerobic digestion to anaerobic digestion with uh, hydrogen enhancement uh, gave us about the double of methane, but 
it costs us 0.4 million ton of CO2 equivalent. That may sound little expressed like that, but it's the equivalent of 61,000 French people producing or the consumption or the, the annual emission of 61,000 French people. So it, it's not negligible either. Uh, and then we can see that we have two big joker, and I think that's important, uh, and that is uh, intercrop. So some crop that you will plant uh, in between two crop and harvest. Uh, so if we don't have it, this change significantly and crop residue, that's the same. Uh, and uh, some streams have negative, meaning that they are better used for anaerobic digestion than their current use. That's the case for manure, that's the case for green waste. So there's no reason not to use them for anaerobic digestion. I will pass this, but we also work in the production of oil. So here it was for heat production in areas where there's no access to district heating, but also interesting could be to look for ships, for example, as an alternative to methane, uh, because methane has the problem of the fugitive emission. Um, I will skip that, but just quickly say that we did some work into trying to to reflect upon when it comes to food waste, especially uh, what should be the priority order. So using the, the pyramid prioritization of the European Union, that has been quite uh, cited this work. And uh, the work on biopump. So we are looking at it for France, but in between we also got a European project called NIGEM, mostly based on or working or focusing on negative emission. But we pushed that concept of the biopump through the whole world to try to scale up, okay, what would really be the, the potential that we can get out of it uh, at the world level. And this is a work led by a uh, postdoc, uh, Ariane Albers. Finally, that's my last slide, but this is where, so I say that we just have some preliminary results or the building blocks, but this is where we want to get at. So we want to have flows on these areas. So basically, we have all the biomasses of France, uh, okay, the electricity grid, the district, district heating grid, gas grid, uh, and even carbon sink. We use these biomasses uh, to produce our different carbon services. We have different technology choices and we produce more than one product. And sometimes uh, one product could be used to feed another platform. And what we want to know is what should be the amount of each of these to direct to each of these. So we um, have an overall environmental impact as low as possible for the 16 different environmental impact categories that we look at. So not just climate as I presented today. Some of our publication and uh, on this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to our discussions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Laurie. Uh, I'm sure there will be many questions. You can either raise your hand or type your questions into the question and answer tool or also into the chat. Um, yeah, any questions? Thanks a lot. Okay, um, while the people are typing or thinking, okay, there are two participants who have raised their hand, Alessandro Porter, um was maybe first or showed up first yeah alessandro please i'm willing to concede if marion uh, actually was there before me uh, <laughs> my apologies say, okay um thank you for uh, an extremely interesting presentation uh, lori uh, it's very thought-provoking as to the possibilities uh, really a wonderful overview um I've recently heard other uh, excitement or perhaps in some of the science or popular science press about artificial photosynthesis as another mechanism for recycling carbon and obviously capturing solar energy. But I don't know, you've obviously must have considered this as well amongst all the things that you've enumerated in your presentation. Is this uh, a pipe dream artificial photosynthesis? Is it? likely to be a viable technology or should we really go the route that you've ident identified here in your presentation? 
But that's thought provoking. I'm not too sure what it is. When you say this to me, I'm thinking of actually solar power <laughs> and the difference in efficiency between that and, and our biomass that is not really efficient to capture the energy from the sun. Uh, yes. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, what is artificial photosynthesis? I'm not too sure. Um, it's, I guess it involves a series of chemical, laboratory controlled chemical reactions that involve basically trying to reproduce what plants have done. Uh, it requires catalysts uh, you know, and these catalysts, of course, are not cheap. Um, but then, there, there is tech, there is a lot of research being done on that. And I, I only came across this. I have to confess, I only came across this over the last few weeks, and I was really intrigued by it. Especially knowing your presentation uh, now has especially stoked my interest. I mean, production of methane is obviously very promising. Um, but it would be interesting to compare the efficiencies. And that's why I'm perhaps asking an unfair question, I realize now, but whether you had some ideas as to what the expense associated with either process is and whether one ultimately might be more viable than the other. I just missed a little word. What, what the expense of, of what, Alessandro? I, I just missed a little tiny part. <laughs> uh, whether the... the shall we say, when you do a cost analysis of what uh, is involved in photosynthesis versus, let's say, conversion of, of, of bioresidues to methane, whether one ends up being superior to the other. Um, obviously, solar energy is abundant. Uh, from my understanding, the amount of energy that the Earth receives from the sun in one day equals practically the total energy consumption of our planet in a year. Yeah. Uh, so it's obviously, it's an interesting possibility, but I don't know whether it's really gotten well out of the laboratory in any significant way or not. Yeah, I must be honest, I'm not too, uh, I don't know too much about it, but though it sounds, as I was saying at the beginning, one problem in this uh, non-fossil carbon economy is that we lack carbon uh, to yes. supply. Of. So if it's a way to, to get, because what are the other options, as I was saying, it's biomass, but here we have, okay, we have our biomass residues, but again, these are limited. <laughs> And then uh, we have land uh, to produce biomass, but uh, that comes with very severe trade-off. So, yes. uh, so the other option is to the DACs that are uh, in place. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know if it can compete or to which extent uh, Yeah, one should make the, the assessment of that. I have to say that the, I know little about it, <laughs> so I didn't consider it. Okay. But okay, no. one would have to say how it competes with uh, with these other, let's say, non biomass alternative or non land free alternative like uh, like tax, for example. Thank you once again. I really appreciated your presentation. Okay, so uh, next is Marion Carrier. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much um, for your presentation, Dory. Um, I will be interested on your um, on the comment, uh, the result that you presented on the biomass option. And uh, you show obviously uh, considerable uh, limitations. But I, I, um, I have a question in terms of how did you validate um, the maturity of the technologies that you you use to compare a pathway against another one. There is the technology speaking. <laughs> yeah, that's a, no, no, it's a, it's an important question, and it is uh, true as well. That's a very big challenge because we work with. Uh, I mean, like what you said in the waste to ingredients, and huh? we work with some frontier technology. So obviously, sometimes there is no data. Uh, available and we have to um, there's two things there yeah, that we do whether you do it based on um, simulation extra or this just or more mature technique just like the the gasification so uh, we had this problem how much of the how much of the syn gas is going to be co co2 ch4 uh, just doing that uh, we struggled a lot, uh, and then we, uh, with some colleague here at TBI, we tried to develop a model uh, to predict that, and that was very good for some stream like uh, the Woody one, where there was some literature data, and we could validate this uh, this stoichiometry-based model, reaction-based model. 
uh, with these little literature data that were available, but when we were out of what existed with some stream, like, I don't know, um, the green uh, residues <laughs> um, or the intercrop, then, then we are not that sure to which extent, yeah, it's very valid or conclusion. I didn't strike that too much, uh, but I think I wrote it in my little blue box. So uh, this is one thing, but another thing is that some of my colleagues, uh, they are doing exactly that, huh? trying to, um, to, to simulate uh, this upscaling from low TRL uh, to high TRL, but, but obviously we have uh, a lot of uncertainty uh, on this. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, in terms of experimental assessment, uh, we we already struggling um, to 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 do and to to, to carry out some viable uh, upscaling uh, modeling uh, ourselves. That's why that's why I was curious about that. But but it, you just mm. have to remember that yeah. what we do is to help decision maker to anticipate yeah. consequences of investment. So <laughs> so we mm. have to do that and deal with this of course. And I didn't show it, but uh, of mm. course there is a a heavy um, uh, like a global sensitivity analysis. So we both deal with sensitivity and uncertainty of data to try to show which is, which boundary this conclusion seems uh, oh. valid or reasonable. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, we have a short question by Karine Despeuves. Uh, she's asking, can we go back to the maps talking, five maps talking about biochar? Why was the first the best case? What about the other three? I think I presented it at the beginning, maybe after that. Yeah. No, I think it is. Yeah, this one. I don't know if I should put full screen again or like that. Yeah, you can. Well, just make the. So, what was the question? What the, about the three last ones in orange re red? Why are they they worse, or what's not not working so well there? I think yeah. the, the orange red is that the the yeah. We're still processing the result as to where in this area, why this area is so bad. So we now uh, our PhD student Christelle, she's looking. Okay, what is grown there? So we understand a bit better the reason. Uh, but uh, the other why here we have uh, let's say not so good result as in this case it's mostly this uh, recalcitrance that i was talking about so the the carbon here is not as uh, stable uh, so it's going to be more prone to degradation in the soil and the uh, second and it like it comes comes out again as co2 so if you put it back in the in the in the in the soil it, it will come out Precisely, it won't stay theory, long. Right? Yeah, precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and then uh, here, what I didn't say, but uh, we uh, we don't have. It's a bit the same as the question from Marion. Huh? How do you validate this? Now we don't have hundred years of experiment of, on bio on any of these <laughs> return uh, to soil, but uh, we try to model this um, this recalcitrance or this degradation over hundred years in different way. So we trick a bit the model. But well, we tried to really see this uncertainty range. And we were always getting this result, just, okay, here the, the it was, the percentage was uh, not like 100 to 200, but still we were getting the same that we can harvest everything and return it as biochar. And we have more carbon in the soil after hundred years than leaving the it as straw at the beginning without mm -hmm. harvest. Okay, excellent. Then we have uh, two related questions from Isolde van Riemsdijk. Uh, the one is, uh, if your findings were already converted into uh, measures by the French government. And the other question is, what at the moment would be your favorite carbon reducing method that cost consumers could start doing straight away? <laughs> okay, that's tricky. <laughs> As I say, we're not uh, uh, finished yet. Uh, yeah, well, it's not a favorite, I don't know, but from what we've done so far, uh, I'd say biogas is to me very interesting because it's flexible. You can, I mean, biomethane. 
So then you have this meeting and it's stored and then you can use it for anything you want, huh? really. Uh, if you need it for energy, use it for energy. If you need it, need it for as an hydrocarbon to produce any type of chemical, you can do that. Uh, the only problem, though, is that you have to be very careful that you don't have fugitive losses because then it's methane and it has, uh, as we know, global warming potential. Uh, well, now it changed, so I think it's 27 times on 100 years uh, higher than the one of CO2. Uh, so this is one I quite, yeah, that I find interesting because of the flexibility that it gives and also because, as I was showing with manure, for example, I mean, you gain so much by not just leaving your manure being stored there and then you have all this methane that end up in the atmosphere anyway here instead you capture it and you can use it in the bioeconomy uh, then the second question what was it uh, oh well, the, the first the, one yeah. the first one was if the french government already yeah. uh, has converted something of their insights into measures uh, no, but I, I before COVID, though, I, I must say that uh, we were invited. So we've been invited, all of us, at the Elysee. And then the Ministry of Environment, uh, then uh, Elisabeth Bond, uh, invited me to go at the ministry. So that was early uh, 2020. And we discussed some of this pathway. So I was really excited that... Uh, that yeah, they could have a look on the work and uh, but no, after COVID, uh, <laughs> none of this happened anymore. So but but it's really the aim that that's why everything that we do, I didn't stress that, but we want to we put it in the open. Uh, we have a data repository platform. We have to structure it a little better, but we want our results to be use <laughs> usable and and use. Yeah. Okay, Laura Alleman uh, already asked a question. You nearly answered that is about the uh, methane and fugitive emissions, uh, but um, maybe we can go into further depths for that. So, so in principle, you're saying that methane should be like the, the uh, unity of exchange, or can can become a, a very important uh, uh, stock, or what, what to call it. Um, but but that there's also the danger of, of uh, having it go into the atmosphere and actually then, then it would be much worse than not, not, not using it, right? Uh, well, that is one reason why we, like for, ex for instance, for ships, uh, we are interested in looking at this hydrothermal liquefaction, which in some way does similar than anaerobic digestion. So you also have some rather wet substrate. Uh, in that case, that you can convert to an oil and that could be used, uh, upgraded and used in, in your ships. So that's something we want to look and see what perform better. But yeah, for methane, it's it's really uh, it's it's really really important to control these fugitive emissions. Otherwise, it's true that, and this is also where we look at with our uncertainty analysis, uh, what should be <laughs> the what should be the threshold not to overpass. Otherwise, you do worse than than not doing biomethane in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one more question. That is how to measure carbon footprint in forests and to mitigate CO2 emission. I mean, um, I guess the question is mostly if you can, can for example, take out some stuff from the, from the woods and, and uh, like thereby make a, wood, uh, a forest even uh, more prone to CO2 uptake. Ah, yeah, well, this we're not looking at because we focus on the, well, to a little extent, but uh, we focus on, on the residues, but we look at that in the extent that we use the bio pumps on carbon vulnerable or marginal lands, but not, not so much at, to optimizing the forest uh, ecosystem, but this is true and some people work on that. I have Swedish colleagues doing this, but yeah, this we don't include. Uh, it's out of the boundary that we've set into what we look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, maybe I have one last question, and that is like more if you if you look uh, at the very big picture, like um, uh, if if we put in um, this uh, jars in, into the into the into the land and use land differently, do you think that that is a comp that that is enough uh, to some extent, or, or I mean, if we if we, for example, still need to use some oil uh, to to uh, fly with uh, airplanes, then then there will be more oil coming out of the um, out of uh, out of the reservoirs, and and then um, 
yeah where should that end up yeah this is uh, what i was saying uh, so now we have we are building these building blocks through different uh, phd uh, thesis and this is where we want to get at to be able to to say it uh, but i don't have the answer yet mm -hmm. i'm afraid do you have a feeling <laughs> not uh, well i'm not uh, because it's so complex huh? you really have to look at the i mean as i said one stream of one platform can go and feed in the other so uh, yeah it's hard to say that i have a, a strong feeling um for now but I, I i do think that again that this gas platform because we can produce so many things out of it even food gives us a lot of flexibility mm 